I am Aaron Schlesinger, and it is go time. It's go time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. We are back for another episode of Go Time. Today's episode is number 18. Today's show is sponsored by Linode and Backtrace. So first, we want to give them a huge thank you for sponsoring the show. Today on the show, I'm going to switch things up a little bit. So first, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Also, we have Carlicia Campos here. Say hello, Carlicia. Hello. And Brian Kettleson. Howdy. And our special guest today is Aaron Schlesinger, which I guess you work at Open Deus right now? I do. Yeah. So, and working on Kubernetes uh, based stuff. And you also have a project that uh, we've seen uh, out, which is uh, go in five minutes. So do you want to give everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Been writing go for just about three and a half years now at a variety of different places and on my own kind of just started as a hobby, uh, hobby project that was coming from Scala, which was, um, uh, kind of a mess at the time. And I was looking for simpler tools to start out. So I came to go kind of fell in love with the community. The first kind of big discovery was how easy concurrency was. And that's what really kind of hooked me. So then I moved uh, to a couple of different companies, all right and go finally landed at Deus uh, and kind of through that whole process, um, just participated in the community in different ways. Uh, and saw when I first started go fi- go in five minutes, just saw uh, there was a little bit of lack of kind of intermediate and advanced content for Go. So I wanted to combine some intermediate advanced kind of material with a super simple format. Um, So I focused on these kind of short five minute screencasts uh, to start out. And then they kind of just grew from there. Uh, Started writing a blog alongside of screencasts and did some longer screencasts. I think the longest one I did was like an hour. So I've just, just kind of been capturing all my thoughts, all my experiences, uh, all my input that I've gotten from people in the community, um, just kind of trying to give back to the community in any way I can through this, this medium of going five minutes. That's awesome. Now, um, talk to us a little bit about what the, the content is there. Is there kind of like a set structure where you're kind of building on top of previous episodes or is this more... Um, based on kind of uh, user feedback questions you kind of see around the web and, you know, answering it in the form of a video? Yeah, um, it's kind of both. So I have uh, my repo on, on GitHub is just basically all the issues are requests for screencasts. Like there's a couple in there to remind me to like, you know, fix the site or something. But almost all of it, the vast majority is just people asking about you know, can I get a screencast on how to use the SQL package or how to do some specific thing with net HTTP and what have you. So I do about half of the screencasts are a response to those. And then the other half are just things that I've seen that might be underutilized or new or something like that. Um, and I just try and distill it down into that five minute format. And um, I try to make sure that each screencast has no prior dependencies. Um, so some of the screencasts will be like, you know, if you have seen this screencast, it'll help you, but you don't need it. Um, but most of them are just like, you start at minute one and it takes you all the way through to the end. And my goal is by the end, you at least know uh, the basic building blocks for how to get something done. Uh, and, and then if you want to go into more detail, I put on the site kind of the equivalent of the show notes, um, links to good blog posts and good documentation and so forth for people who want to like dive a little deeper. No, I think this is really interesting. Um, and it's kind of along the same lines of the um, posts that Ben Johnson has been doing, kind of diving into, like you said, the, the giving people a little stuff to chew on for net HTTP or things like that, introducing people more to the standard library. Uh, I'm seeing that more and more as kind of like a pattern where exposing people to these things they might not be familiar with. And I think that's building on kind of where we're at with the language too, because a lot of people 
are starting to get the syntax down, but now it's kind of uh, idioms and, um, you know, learning their way around the standard library. Yeah. I mean, the standard library is so vast and it's just like, I feel like we're just scratching the surface even now. Um, and now it's growing too. Like we just got context in Go 1.7. Yay. And that's crazy useful. So happy about context. Yeah, me too. I, I think I find that what I tend to do is, is I tend to, to be familiar with at least a base package. You know, like I'm going to be doing something with bytes. And then whenever I'm trying to do something new with it, I try to like explore around and see what else is there and be like, what is this? You know? Yeah. <laughs> or like the, you know, IO T, T reader, T reader. And <laughs> you start, you know, kind of tinkering with it and uh, coming up with use cases. Yeah. I think that's the hard part is imagining the use case before you've actually used it. Um, and I feel like there's even still, there's kind of this chicken and egg where if the community can't really nail down use cases, then the thing is not going to be used. And so use cases won't get developed out of the thing. So it's, it's kind of like someone or some group has to come in and say, hey, this is a way to use T reader and, you know, go try it in your code sometime and see how it works and kind of develop it out from there. Yeah, I think I agree. I think learning is like that, right? You, you, you almost have to struggle first so that when you're exposed to it, you have something to relate it to where you're like, oh, wow, that would have been really useful when I had done such and such. But when you're first just coming across it, you're like, yeah, I don't need that. I don't need that. And then you long forget about it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I've like, I can't even count how many times I've written io.copy myself. And (laughs) it's like, it's like an embarrassment now. Like, come on, you should have remembered that. That's like, the, the, the function in the IO package that you should always know. And then, you know, I just forget and I forget. And then all of a sudden, finally, a, maybe a month ago or something, it just clicked. I'm like, oh yeah, IO copy, it's there. I should use it in this situation. It's kind of funny how that happens. You need to set up an IO copy jar on your desk rather than a swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should. Uh, so what, uh, talk to us about some of what some of the most popular ones are. Do, do you kind of have ones that get exponentially more viewings and followings than, than others, or is it pretty scattered? Um, I think the number one by far is uh, how to write a full stack like web application all the way from like database access down to serving up templates and writing JavaScript. And that one was how to do it without uh, with just a standard library. I think that one got like, I think that was like a 5,000 views after the first week. And the rest of them are kind of like, maybe they get to a thousand views in the first couple weeks. So I don't know what the second or third would be. Wait, but yeah, that was, hang top. on a second. It, you, you did that in five minutes. Yeah. Um, that one was a, a huge hand waving one. Uh, there was tons <laughs> of code that I wrote beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and I glossed over tons and tons of it in the five minutes. And then um, the code's all out there in the, in the Go in Five Minutes repo. So I, su- I heavily commented all of it uh, and wrote kind of a bigger outline in the readme. I'm like, you know, where should you look to do templates? Where should you look to do databases? And so I was, I kind of did all that in the hopes that my hand waving would basically like introduce people to the big building blocks and how they fit together. And then, you know, once the five minutes is up, they can go and drill down as they see fit. So this is more like kind of just starting the journey. Yeah. You know, getting enough kind of a seed planted and showing people where they can go from there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's how, how often are you releasing these? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I started off every week and then, um, pretty quickly burned out, to be honest. So I've been doing like every two to three weeks now. So Adam, I saw that you have a, uh, an episode on sing- the singleton design pattern. And on your repo, you have an issue open for uh, future explain design patterns episode. And by the way, I wanted to mention to people that you have a repo where people can go and make requests if you, they want to learn about something in specific or just upvote the issues that are there. 
And that's, uh, you know, having a repo for that ourselves, that's very useful. And there are so many interesting topics listed there. It's pretty cool. At any case, going back to the design patterns questions that I have, how do you go about um, putting together uh, like the vi a video tutorial for design patterns? Is it based on a lot of work that you have done with design patterns in Go? Or do you try to abstract out how design patterns are done in, with other, implemented in other languages and then sort of like uh, how that would be done in Go uh, kind of way? How do you go about it? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, actually. Uh, I, I kind of do a mix. Um, there are obviously some I've used uh, in my own work, whether it's open source or at Deus. Most of that's open source anyway. Um, but I also look around, like, I ask around on the, the various, there's tons of Slack channels now in the Gopher Slack. So I either ask around or I just look at other people's open source. And then um, I also take some things from time to time from, Scala, since that was the last language I worked in before Go. And that, that angle, I think, is pretty useful to an extent because Scala is so different. It's kind of this Frankenstein between a functional and an object-oriented program built on top of the JVM. And there's tons of stuff in there. Um, things like the builder pattern and functional programming is obviously a big thing there. I think there's a ton of stuff that we can bring over to Go and idiomize for Go, make it simpler, make it fast. So I, I try to take from all three, but I wouldn't say I have like a, you know, a specific strategy or algorithm for figuring out where to take design patterns from and, and how to present them. You know, we had, oh, wow. All three of us all at once. That's awesome. First time ever. Uh, so I was just going to mention that we had uh, Dave Cheney on the show uh, two episodes ago, episode 16, that would have been. Um, and we were talking a little bit about design patterns and kind of how they came about and things. How do you see uh, the design patterns as we know them in, say, like the Gang of Four book applying to Go? Do you think that they all, what's your opinion on, on how they kind of fall in you know should we be trying to leverage all of these things inside of go or do you think that there's certain mechanics about the language that we should try to stick more to go ways of doing things and not necessarily adopt all of these patterns um so i'd say technically of course it's possible I, th I think probably possible to do every single one of the gang of four design patterns but i think that go's simplicity is is actually very powerful and I think Dave did a talk. It was either Dave or Rob Pike, one of those two, or maybe even both. They did a talk on basically saying simplicity is hard and, and simplicity is powerful. And uh, that's like, that's my mantra. I, I read, I watched and read the slides for that talk. And that's kind of what I try to live by with Go. So, you know, if you take a builder pattern, design pattern, something like that, and you bring it into Go. Um, my goal is to try and explain why we should use it instead of why we shouldn't use it. So I would say kind of from a cultural or um, community standpoint, I would rather not take a design pattern and write a little more code rather than bring in a huge design pattern into your code base, uh, make it a little bit less code, but harder to understand. Yeah, I can see that, and I hugely agree with that. I come, I did Java for quite a while, and I knew Java fairly well back then when I was doing it. And in the Java world, at least in my Java world, design pattern was the go-to thing. So it was pretty much uh, there is a pattern, find out what it is, and and stick to that, and that's going to make your life easier, or it's going to make your code quote unquote better. I don't say better without quotes anymore after Dave Cheney. <laughs> but in any case, I think um, that is the trick with uh, software design, I think, is just not trying, not trying to abstract things too early. You might end up pinning yourself against the wall in, like you're saying there, and just writing more code and only really abstracting things into an interface or into a design pattern after you know what it is that you need 
is what I think we should be thinking about as opposed to, oh, I ha we have design patterns. Uh, let's, let's implement that. Yeah. Well, that was kind of Dave's talk too about the solid design, you know, talking about single responsibility and open and closed and kind of the key, the key points that will make software more maintainable. And then, you know, looking at design patterns as how they apply to that, you know, whether they make things more complicated and, and just recognizing the stuff. Th that's the whole thing, right? Like design patterns are neither good nor bad. Well, they're, they're mostly good, right? But they're not to be, it's not religion, right? right? We don't have to look at some problem and then shop for the design pattern to solve that. It's okay to have things that are, that are custom too, if it simplifies your design without you know, creating a lot of coupling or things like that. Yeah. And, and I think since I started writing Go, I kind of started to look at design patterns like just a, a recipe. And if you're a cook, you're going to go, you want to make a, a apple pie. You're going to probably go to a couple different recipes to get the feel for how to make this pie. Like what's the general stuff that goes into it? How generally do you cook it? And then you're going to probably make it your own after maybe a couple pies after you cook for maybe a month or so. And that's what I think the Go community is doing and should be doing. Um, you know, we're, we're not just taking, I keep going back to Builder, so I'll continue there. <laughs> we're not just taking Builder from Java or C++. I've seen a couple different implementations of it, some of which are way simpler than the Gang of Four book or what we see in Java. And I think that there's not just one builder pattern now in Go. I think that there's kind of your mileage may vary and some of the patterns work better for situations than others. Um, and I think that's a great thing. That's evolution. Yeah, and I think we can look through the standard library and we could find examples of, of um, like maybe like the visitor pattern. I, I think the hash sorting is done in a visitor pattern, if I recall. but. You know, we can find examples of that, but I don't think we necessarily said, like you said, I don't think we necessarily have to bring everything over. I think as they apply, we leverage them and we, we benefit from features of the language that allow us to do things in a simpler way than, you know, some of these patterns were implemented because all of, all of these things, especially a lot of the patterns are based off Java, yeah. which has its own, you know, its own set of features, things that Go does not have, and then also things that that Go has that Java does not. So I think, you know, we, we look at our own problems differently and I'm interested to see how we evolve with our own patterns and we start to see some of these, these little idioms that people use, uh, little tricks that are continuing to become commonplace in some of the more common libraries. And I think if you look at um, most large projects in Go right now, it varies so much. We, we haven't converged on patterns in Go that are, are, you know, specific to some of these larger use cases. Like if you look through the Docker code base or the Kubernetes code base or things like that, like things are very different between the two of them. Yeah. I think one downfall of design patterns, especially if you doing something you don't have a ton of experience with and you set yourself to use a design pattern is that let's say you're going to use a specific one and you might want to do something that's a little bit out of that pattern, but then you won't totally conform to the pattern and you make the choice to use the pattern as opposed to doing the, the right thing for your code. Uh, and that's a, a problem. Uh, but if you don't have a lot of confidence, you don't have the experience to, to, with what you're working with, uh, you might end up making that kind of choice. And, and I think it's problematic when you do that, when people do that. But uh, if you keep it flexible, I think there's a lot to gain to at least know what design patterns you can use, because uh, it can be very helpful um, in organizing your code and also increasing the, the clarity of what you're doing. And then it's easier to communicate what it is that you're doing to other people. Yeah, absolutely. If, if people can go back to that cookbook and say, oh, this looks pretty similar to visitor pattern. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, um, on your point, Carlicia, the, the Go programming language now is starting, I think, to give birth to 
concurrency design patterns that C++ and Java can't really do because they don't have a, a first class channel or a first class lightweight thread primitive. So it's even more important, I think, for people to be able to pick up things like the barrier pattern using weight groups and using go routines and then adapt to their needs because there's so many ways that you can use that pattern, for example. Yeah. And I think we see stuff, you know, fan in, fan out and things like that, that become so much simpler because we have the, the concept of the channels. Yeah. It becomes so much easier to do things like that. There is a talk by uh, Rob Pike. It's called Go Concurrency Pattern. And I w I've watched that talk, that whole thing before. And I, I was just get, gashing over it because it's beautiful. The patterns are beautiful. It really is. Yeah, right? You've, I'm sure you've seen it. I, lo I love that talk. Yeah. So, yes, definitely there, there are patterns for concurrency. And uh, because uh, at that point I had done concurrent code in, in Go. And I was just going, oh, my gosh, my, my code did not look like that at all. But I totally, I get it. I'm not, I, don't, I didn't memorize it, but my head was going, oh, yeah. So there are different ways that you can organize codes uh, according to what it is that you are doing. It's, it, so it pays off, I think, for you to know what you can do. Yeah. There was a talk at GopherCon 2014, too, by John Grant Cumming, too, called the Channel Compendium that uh, had a lot of stuff like that with some of the, the patterns with timeouts and things like that with channels, which is also a really uh, interesting talk to watch. And then I want to say Derek Collison's from that year had a bunch of stuff, too, um, that was related to patterns with concurrency and performance related to them. So... I know we volleyed back and forth a little bit on kind of like benefits and drawbacks and, and you know, not, not to be religious about design patterns, but so many of us come from backgrounds where we had to heavily use design patterns, especially Java world, but let, let's kind of bring it in for um, maybe people who are more new to programming and Go is one of their first languages and they don't really have um, a lot of knowledge in the design pattern world to kind of apply, would you recommend that people still study a book like uh, the Gang of Four book and, and learn design patterns for Go? Do you think that it benefits them um, in Go or do you think that they should focus more on just trying to learn uh, idioms for Go itself? I would go with the latter. I know that might be heresy, uh, but I would absolutely say learn Go, learn idioms. And once you start getting more complex and you, you, you know, have a 5,000 line code base or 10,000 line code base or so on, that might be a good time to start looking, looking at design patterns and finding ways to reduce your lines of code using de those design patterns. But if you're starting out, I, I think keeping your code as simple as possible, as understandable as possible, using those idioms that's far more important in my opinion can i just plus one there <laughs> <laughs> i want to play I, I would just keep plus one in things because it, maybe it wasn't heresy yeah i agree with that and i'm i'm uh, uh, very much a newcomer to go so by just doing using the straightforward stuff and learning the idioms you might not have that organization at the end but you're going to end up with a much, much bigger tool belt that you can use because design patterns, they don't really change. So once you know them or once you learn them, they're going to be what they're going to be. But you knowing the Go idioms, if you don't, if you don't take the time to implement them and know what they are, you're going to do, be doing yourself a disservice, I think. All right. It's time for us to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor, Linode. Uh, we here at GoTime love Linode a lot because they let you get a cloud server up running in seconds. You can head over to linode.com slash GoTime to get started. They have plans starting at $10 a month that will get you a uh, cloud server in one of eight different data centers spread across the world. These are full root access machines. 
You can run containers. You can even run your own private Git server. They've got native SSD storage with 40 gigabit network and fast Xeon E5 processors. Uh, lots of neat add-ons like their backup plan and node balancers. And you can use the code GOTIME20 to get two months for free, which is a $20 credit with unlimited uses. So you can tell all your friends too. Excellent. So um, you, you mentioned that you worked at Deus. I'd love to talk to you a bit about the work that you guys are doing there. Um, there's some really interesting contributions you guys are making to um, Kubernetes and Helm and things like that. So I'd love to hear about the work that you're doing there and, and maybe kind of how um, Go is advantageous to you guys there. Aside from the fact that Kubernetes is written in Go. So if you want to contribute, <laughs> you're kind of forced to. <laughs> it's yeah. your choice. Yeah. Um, we have, well, when I first got to Deus, um, I worked on the pass. It, it's now called Deus Workflow, but at that point it was just like Deus. Um, and it was basically trying to be Heroku for, uh, for Kubernetes. Open source, you can go install it on Kubernetes. And then right before I got there, Helm had kind of become a thing, uh, but it looked super different from what it looks like now. So it was just kind of like, how do we get people to easily install the pass? Because there were, I think at that time, maybe there were seven or eight different components. Uh, and you could use most of those components on their own too, if you wanted to. So it was kind of like, you know, this plug and play thing where if you want to use your own logging, you can, but we'll also ship you a component that can do most of the logging stuff that you'll need. Uh, and then there's the router, the routing mesh. You could use that on your own and you could also, it would fit into the path. So Helm popped up because we wanted to give that flexibility to people with, without writing a thousand page document with specifications for each module and having sample manifests and all that stuff. So Go came into play big time with the pass uh, because we had to do things like watch the Kubernetes event stream and, you know, see when a pod comes up and see the exit status of a pod. And when you're watching an event stream that screams concurrency and once it screams concurrency, then I just pick up Go because there's, it's just the easiest thing for me by far. And before we picked up Go, there was some Python. There was some, actually, there was some Go before I came to Deus. Uh, and then there was some shell script. And the shell script component was what I first worked on. And that was the thing that we had to watch the event stream in. And um, we started with a for loop in a shell script. I was going to say, what is this, <laughs> just a for loop, just curling out, long polling? Yep, yeah. So it would, it would sleep for, I think, two seconds and then pull the Kubernetes API. And we made the plunge. I made the decision to make the plunge after we started getting bug reports where people are saying, oh, it missed the pod because the pod would start up and then die within that two seconds. So that's when we took the plunge. We rewrote all that and go uh, and, and just kind of never looked back. That was the that was kind of the benchmark that made us decide we're going to move forward and start writing everything and go. Um, we still have some old stuff in Python and it's working great. Like our API server is actually all Python and Python's super well suited for that. But the other components, like our logging system is all on Go that deals with consuming and fanning out tons of log data. Uh, we have a log storage system, same thing, built on Redis, but the whole multiplexer for all the data just fans into Redis, um, collates all the data. We've got this plugin system that can push the data all out to uh, we've, I think we've got like seven or eight user uh, community generated plugins and stuff. So the Go choice there has been super helpful because it's just by virtue of its simplicity and its concurrency support. Uh, it, it's just like looking back, I kind of think, why didn't we move sooner to Go? <laughs> because it saved us so much strife. Now, out of curiosity, um, all your watches and stuff like that for the event stream. Are you using the, the Kubernetes client library or did you just write like an HTTP wrapper and go? We are almost exclusively using the client library. Um, and I actually just saw today that they split out the client library and they're starting to pull out pieces to a new repo. 
Yeah, there's the client go, and I'm actually in the middle of refactoring out some of my own logic to call that. Oh, man, I'm so excited for that because right now our dependencies are like a gig of all the Kubernetes code and all the dependencies that we don't need. So once we have that, it's going to be like, you know, a couple kilobytes of code, and I'm going to be so happy when we get that. Yeah, I was really happy to get rid of the whole vendored Kubernetes repo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a bit of a mess. So that's awesome. So are you, are you contributing to Kubernetes or is this mostly kind of tooling built around Kubernetes? So most of it is tooling built around uh, when we find warts in Kubernetes that affect what we're doing or we find warts that are, um, that are kind of related to issues that we've seen with Deus, uh, then we usually contribute upstream. Um, but now Helm is part of the Kubernetes repo. So Helm, technically, since we're contributing to Helm, we're contributing to the Kubernetes project as a whole. Um, and we're involved with a bunch of the SIGs too. So we're going to be starting to contribute more and more to uh, Kubernetes core and also some of the projects that spin off of the SIGs as well. Yeah, there's more and more special interest groups now that, that I've been seeing come out. Yeah. It's too hard to keep up with all of them. Yeah. They're, what I would love to see eventually is um, kind of a some kind of centralized schedule for SIGs so that we can all do that and just figure out what is today's SIG and what are they talking about and you know, what's on their agenda. I had to unsubscribe from all of those SIG lists. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain. Well, and there's so many good groups, um, large organizations submitting proposals and stuff for um, expansions to Kubernetes. So it's just, it's really hard to keep up with all the proposals that are going on, you kind of have to, to pick your world and, and hang out there. Yeah. Did, did we mention that SIG is a special interest group and in Kubernetes? We're way out of this typical Go world now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, too, sorry. Too many Kubernetes <laughs> users here. It's, it's all written in Go. It applies. <laughs> it applies. <laughs> We're just getting deep. Yeah. And, you know, to take it back to Go for a second, the Kubernetes code base is extremely interesting from a maybe we could say like an etymology standpoint because the original code base was kind of written like Java and then it came, it open sourced and then people outside of Google started contributing. And now it's like this crazy mix of <laughs> Java like code and idiomatic code and code from other organizations. Generated and, code. Yep. And generated code. There's, there's some proto buffs generated stuff in there. There's a Swagger spec, which was, I think, generated some code at one point, and then they didn't generate it again and started just building on top of the generated code. And it's like looking at this massive code base, you can jump to definition, essentially, and see like the whole world of Go code styles in one repo. It's really amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd have to agree. It, yeah, from file to file, things kind of... Uh, th there's not a whole lot of consistent in certain areas, there's consistency. You can tell, you know, certain groups of people worked in different areas, but if you're bouncing around the repository, you can definitely see, um, the, the style changes. And I think that we'll all, it'll all converge over time. Right. And I always mix up these two books and it's either Bob Martin's clean code book or the, the, um, pragmatic programmer, but they kind of, uh, lead to the they call it the boy scout rule which is always leave the campsite a little cleaner than you found it yeah and you know as long as people are continuously kind of refactoring a little bit to make more idiomatic go out of these areas they touch it's slowly going to evolve into that but yeah you you can definitely see java patterns in there yeah absolutely so does everybody want to talk about any news and projects that have been going on yeah it's pretty pretty big week for interesting things coming out the um the Go newsletter came out today and they, they had a, you know, like an NGROC clone for SSH. And that was you know, generally interesting on its own. I, I can't remember what it was called, but the thing that powers it was much more interesting to me, which is teleport. Uh, GitHub.com slash gravitational slash teleport is a modern SSH server for clusters and teams written in Go. So I had to go touch that and play with it and look at it. And it's really actually kind of awesome. You can install uh, a highly available cluster of SSH bastion servers that will authenticate clients and then 
uh, proxy them off to the servers in your system. So you can have many clusters of servers and all of your, your users just go to your um, teleport services and you can SSH to anything on the other side of the cluster. So it's this, it's really complicated, but cool and easy to use SSH management proxy thing. And I'm going to have to play with it some more because it looks awesome. That's interesting. I actually didn't see that. I haven't seen the newsletter today. So one thing I saw, um, I was either today or yesterday, Brad Fitzpatrick mentioned that uh, they are officially uh, getting rid of the legacy backend for the Go compiler, which means Ooh. from this point on, it will be all SSA, which is cool. Cool. I didn't see that. Yeah, SSA or GTFO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really interested to see that because they'll, it's, it's going to make things much easier to continue to write rules to make more performant uh, machine code out of it. So but look at the gigantic gains that we got just in 1.7. I can't wait till people have some time to actually work on some enhancements to that. I think you know, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10 are going to be amazingly fast and stable and awesome. Yeah, especially when more people start getting in and writing the SSA rules. That, that's far beyond my ability to start looking at assembly language and coming up with these rules. <laughs> well, speaking of 1.9, Vimgo 1.9 was released. We've got a lot of Vimgo lovers. So that was a big release. We should ask this every episode to our guests. So what is your editor of choice, Aaron? Oh, man. Oh, this is like religion. You can't do that, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, um, I use Atom almost exclusively, actually, with the Go, um, whatever that master Go plugin is that installs all the other Go plugins. Yep. It's like MetaGo or something. Um, uh, MetaLinter? Go MetaLinter? No. I think, yeah, I think that's the one. Atom has a, a Go package written by Joe, Joe um, somebody. And it's it called Go Plus. Yeah, Go Plus. There you go. Oh, and that oh, okay, installs so, all the other Go things. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I thought I thought you were talking about all the um, static analysis tools and stuff. There's the the big Go Metal Enter that runs uh, runs a series of them. So I think Go Plus installs Metal Enter. It may not install it directly. It may just install all the stuff that Metal Enter does. Can't quite remember. But yeah, I use I use Atom with Go Plus, and then. I have to turn off Go Imports, which is a bummer because it crashes my computer almost every day. <laughs> Your Go Look, bath is too big. Yeah, looking through all the Kubernetes depths, not good. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I kid you not that I actually have a script run and kill uh, the Go code binary every couple of minutes while I'm working on Docker or Kubernetes libraries because it just gets so bloated. And I mean, Vim of all things becomes useless. It's like press down, wait 30 seconds. So I have to constantly have the, uh, the Go code binary die while I'm working on Kubernetes. You know, we, we have a similar problem. Uh, we got, well, I just got a uh, Docker for Mac. I think it's out of beta. I'm not, I can't quite remember, but whatever it is, it's the new Docker for Mac that runs on the X Hive thing, the new X Hive VM uh, wrapper. And we do, I do all my Go development pretty much inside of a container. So I tried to run Go Vat, and yesterday I forgot to restrict it just to my code. So I tried to run Go Vat on my whole vendor directory as well. And I actually had to restart my computer. <laughs> because the X Hive plugin ate up like 260% CPU. And then that, I don't know exactly what happened, but even like my mouse, my dock, everything on my Mac was just unresponsive. So I had to hard crash, hard kill my computer and restart it because of Kubernetes dependencies again. See, I love the irony in this though, right? Because it's like, you can sit back and be like, look at all this crazy stuff I build. And I still feel unqualified to operate a computer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's funny. I don't know. For me, it just comes back to the whole, why do I keep using a Mac? But, but this isn't that show, so I'm, I'm walking away. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll walk away too. I'll go next with the news. Can I? Yeah. 
All right. So it was just made public that Steve Francia is joining the Go language team at Google. So happy about that. And he wrote a blog post talking about what his role will be. It seems pretty awesome. And the other thing I wanted to mention is there is a repo with patterns in Go. And it looks pretty cool. It's, it, um, it has a, an accompanying website with, uh, with tables for each type of patterns uh, and a bunch of patterns inside each table and with the status. And the status means if there is a code implementation for that or not. And it seems whoever is in charge of this is putting code for that corresponds to each, each of the patterns. Wow, this is this is a uh, gang of four for Go. Yeah, I mean, this is. Do you see this link, Aaron? Yeah, this is pretty awesome. That's not the word I would have used. I might have gotten this <laughs> link from Aaron's um, repo. I'm not sure where I get it from. Yeah, I don't know if I put an issue in. I saw this. There is one. Yeah, maybe there is. I saw this a couple of weeks ago. Read through it, and like you know, at three a.m. So I, I actually think this is awesome because it, it starts the discussion that we're essentially we had. And they might not all be good patterns, but at least it starts, you know, everybody talking about do we need this for Go? Do we not? What should we change? So on. Well, I think that there are some things in here that I can definitely see are ridiculously useful, you know, like in building distributed systems like circuit breaker pattern, right? Like that's. That's something you definitely want. Otherwise, you're going to end up loading, uh, overloading uh, systems. You need kind of that. Uh, you, you definitely need to, to prevent kind of like doing the thundering herd problem and things like that. So, yeah. Let's take just a minute and thank our second sponsor, which is Backtrace. Uh, a lot of software teams are using Backtrace now to, to take the headache and guesswork out of debugging across their environments. Backtrace jumps into action when your Go application fails, capturing detailed application state, including a complete set of Go routines and channels and the wait durations, plus all of the schedule information. Backtrace analyzes all that state information and archives it in a centralized object store, allowing you to explore interesting patterns across your errors with rich plugin data and awesome resolution workflow tools. Uh, great companies like Fastly, Limelight Networks, Message System, and App Nexus are using Backtrace right now. So uh, you can check out backtrace.io slash go time to start your free trial. And we're kind of excited about that. I'm still caught up on this, this design pattern. <laughs> <For> go, <laughs> like, holy cow. Walk away. Somebody put some serious time into this. <laughs> It is. I, I, what I would love to see behind each of these is a conversation about um, whether these things belong and go or or not. You know, the, the design patterns. I, don't get me wrong. I love design patterns, and I love the concept of thinking about code architecturally. I just think that there are some things that have absolutely no business in Go, or should be done in such a way. Maybe that's what the link to some of these should be. You know. You know, there is really no pattern for this in Go. Just use a, a stringer. Yeah. And, and that should be it. I'm glad you mentioned that, Brian, because as we were talking before, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if somebody could compile uh, these idioms that at least you have been talking about that Go has that could be used in place of, a, of design patterns? If we could have a compilation of things and talk like you're saying, this would be a good uh, chance to do that. Um, you know, here's a design pattern. Here's how you would do it by using idioms in Go without actually having to do a full-blown implementation of design pattern. Yeah, more like, um, you know, you may be used to solving this with this pattern and this language, but, you know, this would be the way you would solve the same problem in Go. Exactly. Hey, we have new episodes of Go in five minutes for you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's it's kind of like this whole page is each category might be an episode or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one another thing topic that I wanted to in, uh, talk about is um, did anybody see that post with Facebook implementing the DHCP load balancer and go? I did. I read the whole darn thing. Like that's that's ridiculously cool. I know that Parse um, was using go and they 
got acquired by Facebook, but like now here's stuff where Facebook's actually adopt and go and at the rack level, which is awesome. Yeah. It's really cool. It's very cool. And it's very complicated. You know, I think of DHCP and I think, yeah, I've got a DHCP server somewhere and, and I've managed networks that had even two DHCP servers, but not, you know, so many that you needed gigantic failover redundant systems and craziness. You know, that, that's just a scale thing that very few of us get to play with. That's always the stuff that interests me is the, the ridiculous scale that you don't typically have to think about. It looks like um, they use this to bootstrap containers. They have their own internal container system that this link says is called Tupperware. And it looks like when their containers come up, they use this thing to, to bootstrap their services, which is kind of crazy to me. And to allocate IP addresses and yeah. all that stuff. I definitely want to dig into, into it more. I read part of it and then I got caught up and I didn't finish reading the article, I'll be honest, but it looked really cool. All right. So I think we are about out of time. Oh, the other thing, anybody um, who was not at Golang UK, um, the videos are out, which is awesome. So I've got more videos to watch, even though I haven't yet made the time to watch all the videos from GopherCon and we're how many months <laughs> later? <laughs> Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, we're still waiting for more to be released too. But yeah, need more time. Talking about the videos from GopherCon, there is one particular video that everybody is in awe with. It was done by, it was a talk by Liz Rice. She basically did a container in Go live in her presentation. So yeah, that was a really great talk. I loved that. That was so cool. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Jess Frizzell started, she, I think she started a repo that implemented this proof of concept where Go could build a containerized version of its own binary. Oh. Yeah. It's containers all the way down, man. <laughs> Inception. Yeah. I still like that. Uh, what's the name of that project? The Unikernel one, where you basically could turn your Go app into a Unikernel. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I can't remember what that was now. It's all right. Adam says we have 12 minutes left of the show, so I can sit here for 12 minutes and think about it. I don't remember what it is. And I should. I wish I had the opportunity to watch some of the, the Golang UK videos so that I could make some recommendations, but I just noticed that they were out uh, earlier today or last night. So. I watched Liz's because Dave Cheney sent out a tweet that says, everybody drop what you're doing and watch this. And when Dave talks, people listen. <laughs> so I did. Unfortunately, I didn't see the tweet. Otherwise, I would have listened too. You see, you should have stopped what you were doing because Dave said so. Somebody else needs to go out and tell the rest of the troops. <laughs> I retweeted it. Isn't that enough? Yeah, Eric, everybody retweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I've been absent from Twitter. I don't know where you were. Yeah, it was one of my, my most proud Twitter moments, too, because I, I tweeted at Liz and I said, you know, we're watching for you at GopherCon next year, Liz. And I misspelled GopherCon. Yeah. And boy, did I catch hell for that. Oh, I remember seeing yeah. that. Of, of all the people in the world who should be misspelling GopherCon. <laughs> <sighs> that, that gets the heavy sigh. So being we, we're going to run an hour for this episode, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, another cool project that I saw was, I, I'm guessing it's pronounced Vols, which is a vulnerability scanner written in Go. And this is actually kind of cool. Like It, it seems like um, the InfoSec world is adopting Go for more and more things because there's this one. Um, Mozilla wrote one, I think, called MIG. Mm -hmm. for doing kind of forensic investigations across, um, you know, a, a large cluster. And Yahoo, I remember, wrote one. I can't remember the name of that one. That was a web-based vulnerability scanner that was written in Go and uh, highly concurrent. And I think that they just didn't release the rules that they were using for scanning, but the, the actual project itself was released. And I'll have to find it. and. Before this episode is out, I'll make sure that that ends up in the show notes. Speaking of episodes being out, 
um, last week's episode is um, is live for anybody who's listening right now. And this one will be out in a week. We are finally caught up on time. So we will record one episode and we will release the week prior um, every week from now on, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Anything else anybody wants to talk about? We start getting into some free software Friday. Yeah, I think it's free software Friday time. All right. I'll kick it off because I, I love kicking it off. It's my thing. So I've been reading, of course, Ben Johnson's blog posts. And I don't know if anybody's seen that WTF dial uh, app that he's been doing. But uh, it reminded me that BoltDB is a lot more awesome than people give it credit for. And he wrote a nice justification about why sometimes it's okay just to use a key value store instead of MySQL or Postgres. And so I, I, I wrote two applications over this last week using BoltDB and find it to be about the most simple and painless way to store data on a disk. And so big shout out to Ben Johnson for BoltDB. All right, who's up next? Carlicia? I can go next. I want to give a shout out to api to go It's a project done in Go, and it's for the use case where you want to implement a RESTful API, and if you want your responses. The JSON API spec? Yeah, well, if you want your requests and responses to conform to the JSON API spec, this will facilitate your life. And it will let you do stuff by hand if you want to just use the minimum interface that they have, but they have some interfaces that if you implement them, it will automatically map your routes to the methods that you write in for your REST API. And it's fantastic. I've, I've been using it for my, a project that I'm working on and I love it. I haven't had any problem. It's super well documented. It's got a ton of examples. So there. How do you guys keep up with all of these? We don't. Does anybody have a running count of the number of uh, like REST frameworks? I bet <laughs> I've tried them all. <laughs> I'm willing to. I'm willing to put money on that. I have not seen this one yet. Oh, there are so many. Uh, does anyone know how many are in Awesome Go? <laughs> I need to look at Awesome Go more often. It's been a while. It's probably been a couple months since I've looked at Awesome Go to see if anything new is there. But it's so big now. How would you even know? It's like you need to like export it and then do a diff. <laughs> so my, my problem is that Awesome Go is, I don't think it's that curated. I think it's, it's, it's more, here's a pull request and we've accepted it. And does their definition of awesome meet my definition of awesome? I don't think it does. But I think, I mean, that begs the question, does it make sense to have some, you know, canonical place to look for these things, you know, and then you switch through them and decide which ones you like. Although it's hard to tell, you know, what the adoption rate of one is versus another. So you could do something like NPM search. Oh man, that's a great segue into some <laughs> free software Friday I wanted to mention. That was my troll for the day, right? <laughs> well, if it's a good segue, <laughs> go ahead. All right, well, I, I wanted to mention uh, a library by Sam Boyer called GPS. It is a library that basically you import it into your code and it's about 10 lines of code and you can get the dependencies, the entire dependency tree for any package in a Go data structure. And on top of it, uh, it's being br brought into the Glide project, which if you don't know, it's a, it's a package manager for Go. And it's also going to be used, I predict, inside of, uh, I'm going to butcher his name. I think it's Peter Bergeon. Um, he's running a working group to do better package management in Go. So I predict that this project is going to be used in whatever solution they come out with. And eventually we're going to have something like NPM search for Go, which would be amazing. Just amazing for me. Now that kind of reminds me, there's, um, there was another tool that I saw come out. Now I can't remember where it was, but, or, or who mentioned it, but it reminded me of the, it basically does a, a whole um, visualization of your dependency tree for your project. And for the life of me, I can't remember what the project name was. But I will link to it in the show notes because I will find it because my brain won't be able to let, let it go. But it basically <laughs> drew out a big graph of your dependencies. and Nice. 
Yeah. So that's really cool. Oh, wait. Somebody in the GoTime FM Slack channel just Past it. and he shall receive. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's called GoViz. GoViz. Yeah. I don't even know how to pronounce the GitHub username. Yeah, we'll just put that one in the show notes. And, and link to it on, on Twitter. But yeah, that was super cool too. So for my free software Friday, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Meek Gieben, I think his last name is, um, uh, for Core DNS. So Woo. yeah, that's such a cool project. And, and from the Kubernetes world, uh, Aaron, you're, you're familiar with SkyDNS, right? I am. Is that a question for me? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. SkyDNS has been around and connected to Kubernetes for a couple of years now. But uh, Meek actually completely rewrote it, and he's leveraging and worked with Matt Holt on refactoring Caddy so that Caddy could be more pluggable, uh, kind of the way the configuration works and the, the middlewares and stuff. So Core DNS uh, basically can replace SkyDNS now, but it's massively cooler with the way the modules and uh, middleware and stuff like that works. Man, Caddy, that whole community around Caddy is just awesome to me. I love those people. Word. Big time. I use Caddy for everything for two years now. Don't regret a minute of it. Brian accused Matt when he was on the show of being the nicest person in the Go community. <laughs> I, I still think it's true. He is. I st- yeah, he's awesome. He uh, DM'd me on Slack when he first started Caddy. And he said, do you think Caddy is an okay name to use? I said, well, what does it do? He said, it's like a, it's a better web server. I said, I don't care what you name it, build that. And we, right. people, people will use that. We call it Bob. We don't care. Yeah. Just call it thing. Thing. Yeah. That he's really, I love that guy too. That whole community that he's built around caddy is one of the best in, in software. Yeah. I mean, just, just tying in Acme and, and let's encrypt and just, yeah. Focusing on this concept of like security by default with no extra work, no extra configuration. That's what we need. That's perfect. I'm really interested to see how many other people um, kind of spawn projects, you know, similar to, to Core DNS, like using uh, the Caddy libraries and stuff as kind of the, the building blocks to build their own tools on top of. Yeah, this refactor really made it amazing to do that. So why not? We need a blog post. Somebody needs to come up with a new idea. We did so many blog posts out of this episode. It's not even funny. <laughs> you know what we need is like a five-minute video about it. About, well, actually, I'm way ahead of you. Uh, <laughs> not, I'm not doing it with Caddy. I'm doing the, the ground-up thing with Lego. But oh, nice. Caddy might be a good one to follow up with. I've decided I'm not going to use Lego for anything. I'm not going to manage that. I, I just reverse proxy everything behind Caddy and smile. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, actually. I do. I'm not kidding. I just, I, why? Why do it? I haven't even set Caddy up as a reverse proxy yet. Oh, it's so freaking easy. So, well, I mean, most of my stuff is kind of hidden away right now. I'm, I'm working on stuff that just interacts with Kubernetes libraries and stuff like that. It's not kind of exposed. So I think now we are actually out of time. Anybody have any closing notes before we, we call this thing a wrap? Uh, no. No. Nope. All right, then. So I want to thank everybody for being on the show. Uh, especially thank you to Aaron for coming on the show. Everybody definitely check out his Go in 5 Minutes uh, videos. I think this is going to be really interesting to see all the new ones that come out from this show. I think we've, we've had a lot of good discussion. Um, thank you to the listeners, everybody who's listening live and interacting with us on Slack. Definitely subscribe. Uh, you can go to gotime.fm to subscribe if you haven't already. We are on both iTunes and the Google Play Store. Uh, follow us on Twitter at gotime.fm and github slash gotime.fm slash ping if you want to be on the show or uh, have recommendations. Uh, and with that, uh, definitely thanks to our sponsors today, too. Uh, Linode and Backtrace. And with that, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Aaron, and goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.